Yeah, I was a, an editor up at McFadden's. I edited True Strange Stories. That was, that was how I was getting into the magazine business. And um, that was why Blackwell wanted me to write The Shadow, because he knew that I'd edited a weird magazine with True Strange Stories, and that I was also a newspaper writer and could write fast, and he says, go ahead and write something in this vein. In 1930, publisher Street and Smith decided to try radio with hopes of boosting pulp sales. Each week, a drama would be adapted from an upcoming issue of Detective Story magazine. They added a mysterious host called The Shadow and left the link to the magazine somewhat tenuous. The show premiered over CBS on July 31, 1930. Ken Roberts soon became the announcer. I had come to CBS as a very, very young man in early 1931. I announced many different kinds of programs, of course, but one day fortune smiled upon me and I was asked to come on to a program which had, was fairly new at that time and had been on the air, I believe, a year or maybe less, a program called The Shadow. I was not the first announcer, but I did come on to the program in 1931, at which time The uh, Shadow was nothing like what it was in later years when it featured Lamont Cranston. When I came on to the show, The Shadow was a series of dramatic crime programs solved by different detectives every week. The role of The Shadow on that program was to introduce it and to act as something of a narrator. And once he had done his opening line, he was practically finished on the program until the very end of the show when he came back with the weed of crime bears bitter fruit, crime does not pay, the shadow knows. What went on in between his two appearances on the program, of course, was a, as I said before, a crime program or a pro detective story, things of that sort. And uh, the man who read the lines that I referred to before, concluding with the shadow knows, was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy LaCurta. It wasn't long before people were asking for a shadow magazine. Walter Gibson became its chief writer. Our idea was to make something that sold. And uh, we, we liked this particular thing. Blackwell laid it out very well to me. He said, we, you give them these things in the magazine and find out what they like. And he said, you, they like meat and they like potatoes and they like a couple of other things. And you start giving them these. Well, pretty soon you say, hey, these people... We better give them a bit more of a variety. Let's give them some carrots and some spinach. And you come up with these wonderful things. And he said, what do you find out? You find out that they like potatoes. For God's sake, give them potatoes. That's <laughs> now, the old school stayed with that. But what, what my contribution to it, to which, which Nanovic was responsible to a marked degree because he went along with me and therefore would even come up with suggestions. Ours was to draw away from that and uh, not just make them a stereotype, but we did realize that a lot of the readers were stereotyped. The readers were expecting a certain similarity. So I kept things like the shadow sanctum, but I built, I built in these things and began adding to them. So these new things, and they liked it. And they, I don't think they'd ever done anything like that before. Meanwhile on the air, the host became Frank Reddick. Jimmy left for uh, another job of some sort or perhaps another assignment. In any case, he did leave the show and he was replaced by a gentleman who played the part for three to five years after that, Frank Reddick. And Frank, of course, was one of the best actors in radio. He had appeared on almost all the shows that were on the air at that time. And uh, he took on the assignment. In the fall of 1931, Detective Story Hour became the Blue Coal Radio Review. The program was very successful and remained in that format for, oh, till I think it was 1935 or so, during which time it grew from being a half-hour program to a full-hour program, which was called the Blue Coal Radio Review. The Blue Coal Radio Review was so called because our sponsor was Blue Coal. The uh, director, the producer of the program, was a marvelous man who all the actors in radio dearly loved, Bill Sweets. Bill was his name. 
And in addition to producing the program, of course, he also directed the actual shadow sequences himself. The conductor of the orchestra was George Earle. And we would have a half hour of music and then a half hour of the shadow. And that constituted the Blue Coal Radio Review. The shadow character proved so popular. Beginning on Thursday, October 1st, 1931 at 9.30 p.m., he also narrated Street and Smith's Love Story Hour. They were shifting to Love Story magazine, and they kept the shadow as an announcer on Love Story. I don't know whether anybody's kept those scripts, but for 40 weeks, there were 40 weeks of love, and the shadow was the announcer because Ralston, as the good business manager, says, well, we identify the shadow with Street and Smith, and Love Story is also published by Street and Smith, so keep the announcer, don't get rid of him. In January 1932, the first program using The Shadow as its title debuted on CBS. That fall, it shifted to NBC, and then back to CBS in 1934. The success led to copycats. After The Shadow began to go, um, all the other competition magazines simply said, oh, write something, let's get up a name, something like The Shadow, let's get in there all doing that. And just as they had thrilling love story, popular love story, the dime love story, everything of that sort. They, they all copied the different things, and, and uh, that was the going of it. So that spring all followed in, so you naturally expected them to, to write the same type of stuff. The Phantom was the first, then came the Spider, then came things like Operator 5, Secret Agent X, Dr. Wu Fan. <laughs> the last one of the lot was the Green Lama. People kept asking for the shadow to appear in dramatic portions of the broadcasts. By then, Gibson was writing pulp stories, which featured the shadow as the crime-fighting hero. The series disappeared from CBS's airwaves on March 27, 1935. It wouldn't reappear until the fall of 1937. We began creating a whole new character. Ruth Ruff and Ryan came around and said, can we use the shadow as an announcer because we find it's a good gimmick? And so Ralston said, well, let them use the shadow, providing they say it's owned by Street and Smith and so forth and so on and so on. People like Blue Coal did not want to make more money out of it. In other words, they said, we'll pay for the whole thing. Well, we're through with it with one release, that's all we want. So they gave Street and Smith a chance to take it and later reproduce it on recordings through Michelson. And Street and Smith were making money out of it and getting back the money they'd lost in the other thing. So... Both Nanovic and I agreed that was good because money was coming into the place and they were keeping up the magazine and uh, he was the editor and I was the writer. But as we went along with that, the readers kept writing in. Why don't you have something about the shadow? What is this silly business about the radio program? The announcers to say it was just a gimmick. So we went to Ralston and said we thought that they ought to take the stories from the magazine. In fact, people were saying they should. So we agreed, but the radio people wouldn't have any part of it. Oh no, it was a great announcer. So Ralston took me to, along with him to see different people. And among one of the people we went to see were the Tasty East, who had a thing called the Tasty East Jesters. And we were talking about selling them the, the shadow as a dramatic show. And in that case, John and I would have been deputed to start to put this thing together and talk with their radio outfit and so forth. And uh, they decided to stick with what they had, although they were quite interested. And that was a very interesting thing because when I went with Ralston, who treated me like I was a member of the firm, he was a wonderful person, they asked him flatly what was the circulation of the shadow. And nobody had ever mentioned it. And he told them 300,000 an issue. Now comes the funny part. Blue Cole said, we'll pay you something for it, that's right. Street and Smith property, you control the thing, so forth. Do what you want with them. Street and Smith says, yes, but we don't want those. We want programs that have to do with the shadow because we're going to use it to promote the shadow magazine. And all you have to do is look at the ads in the shadow magazine and you can see why they were saying that. And finally, Blue Coal said, we'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take it for one next season. Go ahead, have one of the shadow stories. Let our script department work on them because we've got fellows that have been writing the kind of stuff, we'll run it. If we don't like it, we'll quit. But they said, if it's no good, 
can we have the shadow back as an announcer? Well, Street and Smith, having nothing to do, said, well, we'd consider that, but let's see how it makes out. It went out, and it was the hit of the year. It was, they should have done it three years before, four years before. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to hear it. And the thing that made it was Lamont Cranston and the characters that they brought in. The, what we, John Nanovic saw to it that enough could be gotten in. And uh, that was its real making. And that's the program they think of now. <laughs>